Roger is the owner and lead instructor of skate sea kayaking at ANSUP in Santa Cruz. A California native, he grew up along and often in the Pacific Ocean, surfing, sailing, snorkeling, and eventually sea kayaking. Sea kayaking. With well over 20 years of teaching experience, he's been a regular lead coach at West Coast Kayak Symposium, such as Paddle Golden Gate, Muppy Waters, and Storm Gathering US as well as teaching classes in Baja, Chile, Scotland, and even the Basque Skills Clinic. He is an ACA level five instructor trainer educator, which is the ACA's highest level of certification of advanced open water kayaking, as well as an instructor trainer for surf kayaking, coastal sup, and an instructor of whitewater kayaking and surf sup. He's also the award-winning co-author of the guidebook Sea Kayaking, Central and Northern California, and Sea Kayaking Rescue. Roger's latest book is Falcon Guides, Basic Illustrated Sea Kayaking. Wayne is an experienced paddler, educator, and adventurer. He had directed adventure programs at UC Santa Barbara for 25 years and was their head kayak instructor. Wayne has filmed and produced the popular USK in-depth instructional, instructional video series specifically for sea kayaking and authored the book, Practicing Good Judgment in Adventures, this guide to making critical decisions. He's very active in teaching instructor development clinics around North America and was a former captain of the US surf kayak team. He is the founder of University of Sea Kayaking, an organization for promotion of sea kayaking education, which hosts an incredible website um, which provides an educational resource to sea kayakers. We're really lucky to have them here today and they're here to talk about incident management and they basically prepared a couple of scenarios. I'm sure you guys all have read the email but the um, the we're basically going to go through a couple scenarios and and answer some questions and go from there and kind of with that uh, Wayne would you like to get started? Right. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, before I get actually into the scenario, because uh, when I ran the outdoor program at UC Santa Barbara, uh, we were training our staff. And it was the whole thing about how do you train good judgment. And that's why I authored that book. Uh, and rather than, aside from, excuse me, talking about this exact scenario, I want to lay a quick foundation for you to think about on any scenario, because part of um, deciding what to do is based upon not only your values, but what's happening around you. And since mother nature is so dynamic and every situation can be so um, fluid, having a standard method rather than an exact answer for each scenario is probably gonna serve you better. So very quickly, when you are going to make a decision of what to do, I have a decision-making process that has six stages. First is identifying the event. Second is evaluating all the necessary and relevant information. Then you have to have your goals, because you have to know what you're trying to accomplish. Once you know your goals, then you can set up your options based upon what you've evaluated. And then once you have your options, you pick your action. And after you pick your action, you have to check on the results. Am I getting my anticipated results? If not, then I go back to the beginning. I look at the event, I reevaluate, maybe I change my goals. So the scenario that I put up was one under the Golden Gate, God, it's close to 30 years ago now. Uh, the group took off from Horseshoe Bay, north of the uh, bridge, northeast, and we went down to the south side of the gate. We did a little compass course, played around down there, and to be honest with you, I can't even remember if there was eight or 10 people, but there was at least eight of us. And there was one individual in charge of the entire group. It was their responsibility. They were, quote, the official leader, and they set the time of when we needed to head back to miss the max ebb. Max ebb was between five and six knots on that particular day. Uh, conditions were good. Wind and, um, uh, let's say, weather were not really a factor. 
as we're heading back, we start to head out towards the sea. And we decided to use a ferry angle rather than straight out. So we tried to ferry angle ourselves across. The group had to stay together. That was one of the aspects. And as we're heading out uh, back to the North Shore, we could tell there was one individual in the group who couldn't keep up with the speed. Now, every one of these paddlers were excellent paddlers, uh, very experienced, fully equipped, ready, dressed for immersion. As we're going up, because we're staying together, as a group, the Golden Gate Bridge passes over our heads, at which point the lead went over to the individual and said, you're going to have to battle faster uh, or we're going to clip a tow rope on. And the person said, you're not clipping the tow rope on me and to get away from me. So the leader left but we keep going out and this person's not making the speed. So eventually, and I can't remember, it was the leader or myself, went over and we just clipped on, because I know part of the way we switched towing. But we clipped on even though the person objected, okay? Um, actually, I jumped ahead. Right now, what would you do if you're in that group? And let's call it, a leaderless group. Okay, we had a leader here. But right now, as you're listening to this, if you are in this group of eight people, what would you do? Anybody have any thoughts? Feel free to. Yeah, wave your hands if you have any thoughts or would like to say what you would do and why. Well, I, I've been in that exact situation in Drake's Estero. Um, where, you know, there's wind on your return and someone's falling behind. And, um, and I did what happened in your situation. We just took command and clipped on and said, you have to do it. That's what we did. Are there any other options? What else could have been done? Any thoughts? I mean, was there really any danger of getting swept out to sea? Did you think that, was that an issue at all? Or could they have just paddled somewhere that was a little bit less? Um, like, did they have to go back to Horseshoe Cove? For our group, yes. But that's another option. See, on, on mine, when I listed out, as I told you, the the six stages, part of the goals of this group was to stay together. But does the group have to stay together? You know, is it a right or wrong? Maybe you keep one or two people with a slower paddle, paddler, go back to the south, let the other three go back up north, pick up the cars, drive over the bridge, pick you up. Or another option, if you're not too worried about the time, how about you go hang out by the, the South Eddy, the South Tower Eddy for a number of hours. And when it slows down the slack, make your way across. And there's lots of options, but it's gonna be dependent upon your goals. The goals that were set for us was we had to stay together as a group. So that one goal dictated our options in many ways. So when you're making a decision, you have to look at what your goals are, and you can always get more options by changing goals. And, and time was a factor for us, too, because the group needed to be back by 5 o'clock as the schedule for the uh, training session. All of our cars were there. So that kind of dictated what we did. But the interesting thing that came out of this for me was in the debrief, the person who got towed was indignant. They raised holy hell at the debrief. And I remember at, at one point, 
I got really angry. And I, I was like, how selfish can you be? Because the thing that was driving them was ego. They don't want to be towed. And I said, well, does that one individual have the right to possibly endanger the entire group? You know, and if they say, well, you can't force me to do anything, how would that individual feel if the group said, okay, you're on your own, we're going across, good luck to you. You know, do you have the right to be part of a group yet not work for the good of the group? Not giving you any answers, these are questions that you need to ask. And one of the things that happened in this scenario, we never discussed the whole concept of towing for the group. Not beforehand, not after. On that specific day, it really made me think about the whole thing about towing. I eventually wrote an article for Sea Kayaker magazine, but whenever I teach a class or run a trip, I take out the tow rope and I said, folks, ladies and gentlemen, this is how we make two singles into a double. Anyone that can't keep up with the group, you're gonna get clipped on. You're not gonna stop paddling, we're just going to add to what you're doing. If we need to group, keep the group together, if that's our main goal, and if we have to make a certain speed or pace. And they have to understand that when we go into it. I personally think towing got a bad reputation because it's a sign of failure for many people. How about thinking of towing as just a way to, again, combining two different speeds? rather than a sign of failure, because they're not going along for a free ride. This individual had to paddle their butt off while the person towing was also paddling hard. And the hardest point, which on this really, I didn't even discuss it, when we got to the North Tower, trying to make that jump around from the eddy up around the North Tower, there was actually about almost like a three foot rise in water. It took four or five attempts while towing the individual to get around the tower. So there is a speed that all of us are going to not be able to beat. So you have to think about towing whenever you're out with a group, but I think it's something that needs to be discussed before. And the other thing is, if this is a leaderless group, I really think one, that type of group should not exist. If an emergency occurs, I do think someone has to be designated in advance who's going to take charge at least of the logistics. And in any emergency scenario, you look at any of the professionals, there's always someone who is in charge to manage the group. They don't have to be the expert on everything, but they have to manage a group. So those are things I'd like you to consider when you're looking at any scenario. So again, you have to identify the event. In this case, it was a double event. We had a strong ebb current and we had someone who refused to be towed. So there were two events going on. And in the evaluation, everyone was well equipped. We had tow ropes, we knew how to use them. Weather wasn't a factor but we were not going to make our destination. And we were confined with the group had to stay together and we had to be back at a certain time. And that dictated our options. And really our only option was to keep the group together and put a tow rope on and ignore the feelings of that individual. Have, have you found, or Roger, maybe perhaps you can answer, have you instituted the we're gonna tell you if you're lagging behind policy on your trips, and have you found that talking about it ahead of time kind of helps soothe egos? Yeah, talking about it ahead of time absolutely can help that. And um, I learned that lesson the hard way. Sim similar thing happened to me in Tamales Bay where someone was getting blown onto the mud flats uh, in the afternoon and uh, would have got stuck on the mud flats until after dark uh, if we hadn't put on a line and they, 
basically same thing, didn't want to be towed, and we just pulled rank and towed them. Um, since then, when I was doing uh, Baja trips a lot, week-long tours down there, I would often do towing on the first morning of the first day uh, and set up inline tow teams. And so make it, you know, you know, kind of set it up as a, this is something we're probably going to, a tool we're probably going to use. And if there were eight people, we'd set up two teams of four or sometimes two teams of three and have two people roaming who could keep up and they would sometimes untangle tow lines or they could uh, be part of, uh, they could, alternate in if other people were getting tired. Um, it's kind of hard in the wind to hear if you're the third person in an inline tow, what the person in the very front is saying so that the people who are free roaming can also sort of pass messages along, things like that. Um, and setting it up before it was ever necessary. So it was just something that we did periodically. Oh, let's tow again right now. It's getting a little windy. Uh, and it's a team effort, and then you're not really signaling, signaling, singling, sorry, not really singling any one person out and take the, take the stigma away a little bit. Yeah. I think I hit my time limit. <laughs> we, can, we can go on to the next scenario. Did you have any uh, finishing up thoughts, Roger or Wayne? On this one? No, I, um, I was just wondering if um, if anybody in the audience had questions, comments. Or you can write yeah, I have a comment. This is Jan Dolzer, Kathleen Scanlon's computer. Hey, Jan. Um, I have a very good experience with not calling it a tow, but a distributing mm -hmm. tandem. That makes it much easier for people to overcome their ego. Yeah. And that's really what it is. It is a tandem that is distributed across two boats. The expectation, of course, is that the towee still continues to add. Uh, yeah, Tom. Hi. Um, one thing we often, we sometimes do in Basque, either in training classes or on a regular paddle, is the initiator um, kind of sets a ground rule during the safety talk. Um, we might ask you if you want to tow, and you're welcome to say no. We might ask you a second time, <clears throat> and you're welcome to say no. And the third time, you're required to say thank you. That's uh, interesting. That's interesting. I like that. Yeah. Sometimes you may not have the luxury, though, of the second and third time. You just ask, do you want to tow? No. Do you want to tow? You know. Do you want to tow? <laughs> yeah, do it real fast. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, we can move on. All right. I think we'll, we'll move on to the next scenario then. Uh, I just had one thought. One of the things I want folks to keep in mind, Roger and I, almost all the time when we're out, we're in charge of the group. So it's, we come from a different point of view because we're many times legally responsible for the group. So in that form, in, in that position of authority, I don't want to use the word dictatorship, but sometimes it comes down to that. And we have that right because not only <clears throat> are your lives in our hands legally, but we also have our own liability concerns. So we will do things that we can get away with a lot easier than in an, a group, uh, a club group, where you don't have a designated leader. That's something to keep in mind. And that's why I think it's always good to have some type of designated leader in case of an emergency. You don't want to first figure out who's going to be in charge when there's an emergency. I just want to throw that in. Thank you very much. All right, Roger, do you want to tell us about this scenario? Yeah, that's a nice segue to the reason I chose this scenario, because it was one of the uh, few times when I wasn't paddling uh, as the leader, um, was a group of friends, um, uh, several Neptune Rangers, and we were paddling from Carmel Beach up to Cypress Point on the Monterey Peninsula and just looking for some rock garden play. Um, so they, they can see the conditions there. I don't need to read them. Uh, 
And so we weren't having much luck going up along the peninsula until we got, actually can go back to the original. Sure. Slide. So um, we were able to get in the first cove there, uh, Stillwater Cove, and a lot of protection there. In fact, there was too much protection, so there really wasn't much going on there. As we got up along that next stretch, um, it was a little too spicy and things were too close to the rocks. And at the end of the line there where it says 3.6 miles, um, we ran into some nice little rock garden areas that had some protection, but also some waves going through. So that's where the next, that's where the next slide is, is right at the end there. There we go. Fun little spot. Um, the boats weren't nearly that big. Um, one of the things, to, uh, see I was in the orange boat, uh, one of the things to note is that the green and yellow boats were play boats, um, green boats or uh, Karma RGs or something like that, so they're little 10, 12 foot <coughs> boats, and that, that ended up becoming an, an issue later on when the rescue happened. Um, so I think go on to the next slide. And the green boat decided, everyone just started sort of breaking up a little bit at this point. There wasn't really a plan except to go, you know, let's explore and see where there's a, some slots we can get through. The blue boat headed through that channel. The yellow boat followed. The green boat decided to go around the outside to check things out. And I realized I was sort of unconsciously putting myself in a position of maximum use of being able to see as much of the group as possible, um, even though I wasn't really the leader. Um, and as the green boat disappeared around the corner and the other two boats disappeared around through the channel, then I was left with a decision. And did you end up putting a, a scale? Scale? Yeah, or is that the next one? I think it's on the next one or the one after that. Okay. So in the parking lot in the uh, upper right, you can see some cars in there and some teeny little kayaks sitting in the parking lot. So the kayaks are really somewhere more about that size. The uh, channel from the where the red boat is to where the yellow boat is is probably about 60 yards long and then another 50 yards out to safe water where the blue boat is um, beyond the reef. Um, we had some pretty good sets coming uh, in between a lot of fairly you know smaller waves and it's a little choppy and hard to see the sets coming. And I think at this point, I just wanted to ask people if you were in the orange boat, when the red boat started following down the channel, which boat would you follow, the red or the green boat? What, what would you do? Anybody? I don't see any waves. All right, let's do this way. Hold up number one if you would follow the red boat. Number two if you'd follow the green boat. What, are you seeing people? Yeah. yeah. Most people look like they're saying two, although there's a pretty decent contingent that's saying one. So and, I'd say it's 30, 33% one, 63, mm -hmm. 66% two. And two was which? Green boat. Why green boat? Anyway. Anyone wants to respond? Otherwise, I'll. Hey, Tom. Thanks. Well, normally in rock gardening situations, you want to <clears throat> keep line of sight with with other boats. So if the green boat was out of sight, now I can't tell from the photo whether the green boat would be out of sight, but I'm guessing it would. Then that's really um, uh, not generally acceptable. In uh, to be to be clear, as the um, this is of course a drone's eye view so you can see everything the only thing i could see as soon as the green boat went around the point there where the arrow is uh was the red boat the the two boats that went down the channel and then turned to go out to sea uh disappeared as soon as they left the channel from from the uh kayaker's eye view so i don't know if that changes anything for people and really didn't know that from from the drone's eye view you can see that they're going to meet up on the outside really weren't sure what was around on the outside where the green boat was going from in the in the channel from where we were. 
So just to keep it moving, I uh, will uh, glad you had a chance to think about it. Um, I ended up thinking that um, more people had gone <laughs> down the channel than had gone out. The green boat had sort of broken off from the group. And um, I mean, there's one thing is since they had broken off from the group, maybe I should have gone that way to support them. Uh, but I also kind of felt like they left the group and that more boats went the other way. So I would stick with the, with the bigger part of the group. So I started, the red boat started following the other two boats down the channel. So I started following the red boat. So I think we can skip to the next slide. And um, the red boat saw the blue and yellow boat head out the channel and turn out to sea. So they were the least skilled of the group and just followed blindly essentially. And so as soon as they came out of that channel, they got hit by a big set. Okay, it wasn't quite that big, but that's sort of the idea. It was splashing up against the steep cliff. Um, they were washing up with the wave up the, up the cliff, not hitting anything, not really in any danger, but um, definitely a scary situation then probably. Um, they capsized at the top of the wave and got flipped over. Um, the next wave, uh, as they were trying to swim, as they were trying to roll, hit, uh, the next set wave hit them, uh, not ended up coming out of their boat. And then the third wave threw their boat up on the rocks. And from our view, the boat disappeared over about an eight to 10 foot wall and it was just gone. So now we've got a swimmer in the water at the base of this cliff. cliff. Um, most of the people except me were wearing wetsuits um, because they felt that that would be safer um, if they swam around the rocks. Um, I've swam around a lot of rocks in a dry suit and I know some people have had dry suits rip on the barnacles, but mostly the dry suits I think are pretty sturdy these days. Um, so it did become an issue when that person was in the water of uh, not having a dry suit on. So now as, as part of this team, uh, if you were me in the orange boat or one of the other boats out there, how do we get this, what do we do with this situation? The person was in, real no, in no real danger. Um, what's, as far as hitting the rocks or anything, they were, they were sloshing up and down and there was, about a, there was a three wave set and then there was uh, a nice window. So what are some what are some options now? What would you do? I've seen any waves. What if we randomly called on someone and put them Yeah, on? let's do it. That's let's do Laura. <laughs> I pick Laura. I'm calling her out. Hey, Laura. Hey. Oh sorry guys, gotta go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So I in the I was kind of trying to read the look at the chart more because um, it looked like from one of the previous maps that you were close to the put in to the parking lot. So if you could bring the person back and just regroup after doing a swimmer's carry um, and then maybe hike to where you could see where their boat was and see if there was the potential to do any sort of boat recovery. But at that point, I feel like if their boat's gone past the point of recovery or you know, known ability to recover, it might be best just to take them to their car, have backup for the swimmer's carry, do it mm -hmm. from the outside. What, what's your thought about the swimmer's carry? Why that? Uh, just in case. Well, the swimmer's carry because there's no other boat to put them on, right? So you have to get them back. Um, they they can't really swim back. And 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 what's the um what's the main danger we have going on now? The main danger, well, there's definitely hypothermia yeah, risk. Yeah, absolutely. That's what that's what we thought. They'd get get them try to get them up on the on the back deck of a boat. So which boat, if you were gonna tow that swimmer, which boat do you think would you think has the best option of doing that? Who's who's best positioned right there? Best is, and you told me that they're the two people who are the least experienced in the group, the red the person, and the person, the red person in the water and everyone else is around equal experience yeah. level. Yeah. 
Hmm. I think it also, it, it may also depend on like what's the state on the interior route as well, but you probably want someone from the outside to come in back in and to be on call to assist in case it compounds. But I would say if you're that orange boat coming in, finding the right window, doing a swimmer's carry and going against if you can, but ideally having somebody with you to help visualize, communicate with the group and back up. That's what I would yeah. say. Anybody else have any um, burning desires to say a different solution? How about David? Come on, David. Yeah. Let's get David and then. All right, I think uh, you have to choose the right boat too. You mentioned that there were you know, smaller boats, 10, 12 foot boats. Absolutely. You need to have a larger boat to add an experienced paddler to carry them on the back deck. Wayne, did you have? Yes. I got a quick question. Uh, you can, uh, Henry, uh, you can, uh, you're looking at the screen. How many people have actually did a back deck carry on their boat in rough conditions and how far did they go? If you if you have really experience on a back deck carry in rough conditions, raise your hands. <laughs> Got three, I think. Small I think number three. trickling in. Three, maybe uh, two, not including instructors. <laughs> <laughs> that it's one of those things that's you know we whenever we teach it, we show you how to do it, and it's usually done in calm water. Roger's going to tell you how he felt, but um, there are some additional ways you could do a swimmer's carry, which I'll bring up after Roger's finished. And Laura, I really want to thank you for throwing those thoughts in. Yeah, that was uh, uh, it was nice to have have those. Basically, that was what what we did. Except we um, we didn't go to the parking lot. We weren't that close, um, and. It's hard to say from from just this picture what you know what's really going on out there, but we definitely did first first thing was to get the swimmer on a back deck. Now, also one of the questions uh, before the before this event was um, how to rescue around rocks, and one of the things is to get them uh, often would be to get them away from rocks. If I was even if their boat wasn't up on the uh, gone, uh, I wouldn't want to do the way the the way the waves were breaking in there, I wouldn't have wanted to do the rescue in that area. So getting them either on the back deck or just towing them while they swim in the water, getting them either back in the channel or out to sea by the blue boat um, it, it is kind of what we'd want to do in that kind of a situation. Uh, somewhere safer water, we have time to then uh, do a tea rescue or, or something, get them back in their boat. Um, but of course, in this situation, we had to get the boat back first. Um, I don't remember exactly why. Uh, maybe I was pointed that direction or they had drifted away from the channel or the channel wasn't that friendly. Um, but go ahead and uh, switch to the next slide. Please. Is, um, I, I forget specifically why I think uh, they had drifted out a little further, but um, Heading in that direction, it was just easier to pick them up and keep going with my bow facing into the seas um, to bring them out into safe water. In the meantime, the blue boat paddled back inside and was able to land um, along the rocks there and scramble up and eventually <laughs> retrieve their boat and get it back in the water over back by the blue boat, which you know probably took about 10 minutes total time. And so now the red boat and the blue boat are down over by the water. Um, one of the big issues was, it seems we had radios, but I don't remember why they weren't access accessible or we didn't think about it, but we didn't use them. Um, and it was before the days when most people were carrying radios in their pocket, just totally accessible. Um, so it was a little unclear how we were going to get, you know, if, if we should bring the swimmer back around where the green boat is going, if the blue boat was going to um, tow the boat out to us, if we should try to get them back inside, the swimmer back inside. If so, I didn't really want to try to get back inside um, 
the sets were too frequent and coming quickly enough that I didn't really think I could get back from outside back to inside through the main channel. I'd want, and I didn't really want to paddle all the way out and around, especially it's one thing to practice with a back deck swimmer on in calm water and tow them for 30 seconds or so, which is typically what we do in a class. And another thing to have a 200 plus pound person on your back deck, making your boat pop a wheelie by about a foot and a half, um, and just bracing like crazy for 10 minutes. I was getting exhausted. And the only boats out there, you'll notice where all the sea kayaks are, were the short boats. And we were absolutely, whoever said that about the short boat not being a good um, boat for putting someone on the back deck was absolutely true in that situation. I didn't really have any um, anywhere. I would have loved to have swapped out and let the swimmer get on the back deck. But the swimmer was already of one of the other boats. Um, but since we didn't have sea kayaks out there, that became a big issue, um, me getting tired. And um, eventually the green boat paddled around and was able to talk to the blue boat and let us know that they were gonna come back around that way. Yes, there is a 20 minute, and after, and I haven't seen the video, but they definitely did discuss this uh, at length when it happened. Thanks, Laura. Um, did everybody see that pop up? That's visible to everybody, right? Yeah. About the Neptune Ranger video. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely something we debriefed um, about. Yeah, it would have been nice to have radios, although I, I couldn't have accessed my radio. I was too busy bracing. Um, so I would invite you to uh, practice swimming, having swimmers on the back deck for an extended period of time. It's actually great bracing practice. Um, and so we were ab uh, able to get the, yeah, Dwayne. Roger, I just want to interject here. <clears throat> a friend of mine, um, Boston Bob Burnett is his name. He wrote an article for Sea Kayaker. He came up with a, um, a back swimmer carry that's called the single wing or the double wing. And imagine a typical back deck carry. That's one person trying to brace, trying to do all the work with someone laying on their back deck. Take a second or a third boat and have them come up behind on either side and put the bow of their boat into the armpits of the individual on the back deck. So they're pushing from behind, paddling on the outside of their craft, just on the outside. If you have a double wing, that's one on each side, you now have a trimaran. It is so stable, it's unbelievable. And the speed that now happens is great. So these two smaller boats who cannot carry somebody, they could be pushing. So rather than what we've been teaching for years is a single boat carry, that's good if there's only one on one. But if you have a second and a third person along, so if there are four people, you can have one laying on the back and you can have three doing the transfer. And the stability again is phenomenal and the speed is great. So next time you get out in a practice session, try that single wing or double wing. Yeah, we could have used those two boats to, to paddle back around to where the green boat is now and then the tow back out there would have been, been a bit quicker. Yeah. Um, so uh, eventually about probably about 15 minutes later, we had the person back in their boat um, be a T rescue when the blue boat towed their boat, the red boat back out to where we were. Um, and it was about a less than a quarter mile, about a five minute paddle to the north to a, a protected cove and a beach. And we all stopped there for lunch and uh, everything was fine until we noticed that as we were getting excitedly debriefing everything and how we could have done things differently, we noticed that the person in the red boat who had been fine, had been paddling and said they were cold, but they, they were, um, once they were paddling, they were pretty amped and they were happy to be back in their boat. And we were happy to all be on a lunch beach and eating lunch. We noticed that the person wasn't really engaged in the conversation anymore and was getting more and more withdrawn. And uh, it took us a little, about five minutes too long to realize it's because they were hypothermic. And so we finally clued into that, that they were pretty withdrawn, asked them if they were cold. This time they were said, yeah, I'm really cold and a little bit, getting a little bit disoriented. Um, so we were able to peel down the wetsuit, and that's why I think where a dry suit would have been better. They would not have been probably as cold uh, from a 15-minute swim 
as they would have uh, in a dry suit. Um, we were able to peel down that. We, we had plenty of clothes to put on them and some warm liquids to feed them. And um, they jumped around and did some exercise and they warmed up in 15, 20 minutes and we're, we're fine and we all paddled back. Any, anybody have any comments or questions? I think uh, David had a question. Mind if I call on you, David? Nope. Sorry. Oh, thanks for the link, Peter. All right, any other questions? I think at this point we can, we can start and focus on responding to Roger's scenario here, but we're about reaching time for the general Q&A that we uh, wanted at the end of the webinar. So we're really starting to open it up here. If you wanna raise your hand or type a question and we'll, we'll call on you. Okay. Do you have any questions? Not in particular, no. Oh, Jonathan has a question. Yes. Yeah, this is, this is a question I, I think I sent in by email. So Basque is, uh, a club which has this adventure in common organization and there's initiators of paddles, but they're not leaders of paddles. So incident management becomes difficult. You're not going to have a pre-existing leader sometimes. Can you imagine this working where, um, I, I guess what I've seen happen in mass is that some have as long as they understand, you know, how to be a leader and to manage the communication and to manage the scenario and to observe when things aren't working and change what you're doing and all those, the safer acronym things, um, that works. But do you have any comments on that for Basque? I, I think I can't see the club changing and saying all paddles will have leaders. Yeah, and this, this group didn't have a leader uh, and people just were experienced and acted um, and we sorted it out. And one of the debrief, things was that we talked about later, it really wasn't unsafe. It was just slow and sloppy. We could have gotten things done quicker and been more clued into the, the um, hypothermia when we first hit the beach, instead of so excited to eat lunch and, and debrief what had gone, all the excitement. Um, so what, what, happened, what took us you know, 15 minutes, we probably could have done in half the time. And that person wouldn't have, the, the swimmer wouldn't have been nearly as cold. One of the, yeah. one of the uh, things I keep coming back to is close the leaderless group. And if you look at it from a decision making standpoint, it really comes down to chaos almost every single time. It could be short chaos or it could be long chaos. <clears throat> I think some guidelines personally should be set for any panel of the group, whether it's Basque or any of the group, that at the beginning, when you're meeting up at the beach, there's some ground rules that are put down. I don't know if Basque has specific ground rules, but is there any discussion about, can anybody leave the group at any time? You know, uh, how many tow ropes do we have in the group? How many extra paddles do we have? How many people have radios? you know your assets before you leave. All right, who has the greatest first aid skills? Great, if somebody gets an injury, Jill's in charge. She's an EMT. Now, that would be a situational leader, okay? Who has the most, you know, experience in rescues? You can ask those questions and rather than having one grand poobah, you would say, okay, if this comes up, we're gonna to defer to this person. But again, in an emergency, it's better to have at least one person at least taking charge of the logistics in terms of things running smoother. They don't have to do it, but they would designate. And I, I really think that should be a discussion for Basque to have those discussions before a trip. And maybe a secondary or, or tertiary leader as well, in case the person who was the initial leader is the person who's in the water at that point or something. Exactly. I mean, sometimes I think yeah. it's clear, like um, I know the, the thing with Karn when he was stuck in the cave, um, 
there, uh, Greg Berman, I forget who else was, was there, but there was some, you know, really experienced people who've been leading in the Bass Skills Clinic that it was probably pretty easy for people to defer to somebody with that kind of background. Um, but on other paddles, when it's uh, not so clear, I, I, I don't know, that's, it's, a, uh, it's a challenging situation. But I think communicating ahead of time is probably the best way to go. Kind of have a, have a sense of a, a plan ahead. I just want to point out, Wayne, so the job of the leader is communication and leadership. It's not about rescue skills. That's, that's it, the it. Correct. It doesn't have to be. Uh, they're communicating. They're the, let's call it more of an organization, the logistical manager. They don't have to do, be the one to do the rescue. You know, if, if I'm managing a group and I know that somebody has specific skills, I'm going to say, hey, go take care of this. And one of the things as an instructor, I know that we do an instructor training. Many times new instructors jump in uh, or instructor candidates, they jump in, they lock themselves into a position. And Roger knows this, you know, they're so involved in rescuing the individual that we have someone else in the back door there taking off. You know, they have these blinders on as Roger's doing right now. So someone who's going to be looking at the bigger picture, if there is a cat size, they'll look and they say, okay, you know, um, Jill and George, you go in there, you take care of them. I'm still looking at the whole scene, right? I'm not going to get stuck or am I going to be the first one to clip on a tow rope? Now I cannot go over and rescue somebody else if they get in a situation that someone else can't handle. So it's using the resources of, of the group. The, that whole thing of being leader, many of these groups who don't have leaders, sometimes they're like anti-leader. We don't want a leader group. But th I still think there needs to be some type of designation for emergency purposes. I mean, let's look at, you know, going across, you know, the bay, playing out there, um, out of the marinas down there in Oakland Bay. When that wind comes up, if you're out with a leaderless group and all of a sudden everybody's getting spread apart, who is the one that's going to bring them all together? Who's the one that's going to say, you know what? I think we've got to turn this group around. You know, you just don't want to have, all right, um, should we do something? All try to get together. What should we do? That all well and fine when things are calm, but when things get difficult, there really needs, again, personal opinion. Someone's going to be in charge. Even when I ran um, trips for the university, we had uh, two leaders taking out every trip. They're the designated leaders. People have paid for this trip. But amongst the two leaders, I designated one of them with final authority in case there was an argument of what to do. It always came down to someone had to have final say in an emergency. And I, I think that's something that should be really discussed amongst the Bass, the Bass Club in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Tom, could I call on you? All right. Sure. Um, we've discussed this an enormous amount, and it's a problem we grapple with. Um, one difference between your situation as, as a kayaking instructor and a kayaking guide is you often have a group with a leader, but they may be all strangers. We often have a group of people who know each other very well, and we've gone through a lot of training often together. We've had a number of incident management classes that taught by professional instructors, lots of rescue practice and instruction. And we are taught um, repeatedly that in a, an emergency of some kind, um, that even though we don't have a formal leader, somebody, and it may be a person that happens to be in the right place at the right time, needs to take charge. And that's pretty well respected. And because you know the people you're paddling with for the most part, and people kind of have a sense of their capabilities. And we also discuss it somewhat, we have a, a tradition of a pretty detailed safety talk at, before we go out to, and the initiator is the one who sets the parameters for the paddle and what the expectations are. 
And some initiators are very good at some of the things you've mentioned um, of preparing people and, and assessing what resources you have. Others are not quite so, are, are pretty loose. But um, I've been surprised at how well it usually works out that people step up and take leadership roles when it's needed. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of places where things just kind of fell apart. Okay. I think with that, um, let's, uh, let's move it on to um, one of the, some of the other questions. One of the big questions was about the cowboy scramble and is it a, oh, of course. All right. Is it a rough water uh, rescue or is it, should you use it instead of a roll or what? Um, and we have this video here and it proves that it's of course if you could roll you wouldn't need to do a scramble so this is a kim granfield video of um some guy i don't know under the golden gate bridge in some pretty rough conditions um never looks as rough as it really as it is but it was probably a two to three foot chop and uh, we're C on about a four knot ebb and probably had 15 to 20 knots of wind with white caps blowing against the current. I feel like the, got the. So I think the key to any rescue working in rough water is, is practice. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna throw a, I love the cowboy like any other recovery, if you can do it. Um, just watching that one video that we saw, there are some people who cannot lift their boat and drain it. He was able to do it in those circumstances, but there are some people who are just not strong enough or have arms long enough to lift the bow to drain it. There are some people that have small cockpits that they can't, once they put their butt in, the seat, they can't put their feet into the cockpit without getting up on the back deck, in which case, kiss yourself goodbye. I mean, Roger, you know me, you know the size of my leg. Yeah, I've seen people, uh, I've seen people use that in the surf zone, um, miss their role in the surf zone, and although they couldn't get their legs in, they were able to get their butt in, and once your butt's in, you're pretty stable, especially if you practice yeah. it, and they were able to paddle out to deeper water where someone could stabilize their boat, they couldn't drain their boat either. Someone could then help them drain the boat with a tea rescue and get them back in. Um, right. I don't think that scrambles a rescue for everybody. Um, just like a lot of uh, you know, a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to roll, and it's it maybe never gets reliable enough. Um, right. There, you know, it's good to have backups. Um, I will say though that if you put about half as many hours into the amount of time you've spent at the pool learning your role, that probably your scramble would improve immensely. And I'm guessing that most people who don't use the scramble and think it doesn't work don't have an hour's total practice. They probably practiced five or 10 minutes at a time, didn't have a lot of success, and gave up. Probably after five or 10 minutes with your role, if you gave up, you would never learn to roll. It's gonna take repeated you know, pool sessions, couple an hour or two at a time some people take three or four or five or ten or twenty you know hours of practice but if you put five or ten hours into your scramble there's a good chance that it might um, improve quite a bit and be fair I, I agree with you hundred percent and I think the key of what you said is you got to have options yeah you know a scramble if you need to get quick and dirty I mean you're in a rock garden and you come out of your boat that may be the quickest way you know, um, to, if you can't roll, right, to just get in um, and get out of the area and then use a different recovery later on, you know, to get your feet back in the boat. And I agree with you. Very few people, I think, they don't spend the time they should on the scramble. To say that you can't use it, no. But I know some people who have actually said, oh, I can do a scramble all the time. Well, <laughs> I have difficulty with that because I know conditions where they're not. All right, so sooner or later, something's not going to work, and you better have your bag of tricks. 
Yep. Oh, question for you guys. You know, Guarding, um, um, what I don't like about the, uh, the re enter roll personally is that since I can drain my boat in most situations, in fact, in rougher water, it's easier to drain your boat because as the waves are going up and down, you can kind of time it. But even if you can't drain your boat, um, you'll generally have less water in your boat after a scramble than you will after a re enter and roll. That said, a re enter and roll is uh, quicker. But it does beg the question, um, what are you doing in the water in the first place if your roll is? Yeah. Now, when I use re-enter and roll, um, there are a number of, I'd say, core recovery techniques I think anyone should have. But at the very least, they have to have a reliable solar recovery above and beyond anything else. Because if you can't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take care of others. Yeah. You know, the, I think the misconception, safety in numbers, um, sometimes get people in trouble. You know, I, I think that a group is good if everybody can do a solo recovery, then they can help each other. But if someone goes out there and they cannot do a solo recovery, they are a liability. Okay? Not that they shouldn't be out there, but they are a liability because they have to depend on someone else for their recovery. And that puts them at a disadvantage. So having a reliable solar recovery, if you have that, then you're an asset to the group. And then after that, you have any number of recoveries you can play with. Yeah. And I just you know, but to enter and roll, you should practice paddling with a cockpit full of water mm -hmm. in rough conditions. Yeah. You know, that should be something that you should do, and that'll help you. Um, also with paddling with someone on your back deck. Yeah. If you can paddle with a boat that's three quarters full of water on a rough day in front of a, uh, a seawall, yeah, now you're talking about knowing how to paddle in balance, you know? And I think, you know, whatever it is you're doing with, with the rescues is, uh, it requires regular practice. Yeah, uh, they're they're perishable skills. They'll go away if you don't practice them regularly. Um, also, I wanted to point out that the link on the bottom there uh, is to a Sea Kayaker magazine article that was surprisingly still online. Um, that kind of does a, a step by step um, way to practice your scramble in rougher and rougher conditions. Some tricks you can do to um, thanks, Laura. Uh, and things you can do to improve to uh, to improve your scramble rescue. A lot of it's just you know, every time you launch, for example, even on flat water, especially on flat water, don't get in your boat and knuckle walk, um, wade it out into the water and practice a scramble launch. So it just gets your balance that much better. And spend a lot of time on your back deck playing around. And uh, anyway, there, if you want to put some a few hours into your scramble, there's a uh, there's an article that'll um, Give you some uh, ideas of a way to uh, uh, some good progressions. Perfect. I think and Roger, with your uh, statement about perishable skills, I like to ask my class: When do you know your skill? When do you know your skills no longer work? <laughs> the answer is easy: When you try it and it doesn't work. <laughs> so my next question is: When do you want to find that out? When you need them, or Perhaps go out on a training session and practice. One of my favorite things to do in instructor classes now, Wayne, is uh, go to Yellow Bluff. And after we peeled out and played in, played in the waves for a while, is then jump on my back deck and, and do a peel out and, and go out and paddle around in Yellow Bluff on your back deck. Okay. And people think I'm kidding. It's like, no, no, do that. Now you know how your students feel when they're out here for their first time. They feel really tippy. And yeah. if you spend extra time on your back deck in rougher and rougher water, it gets uh, more and more comfortable. Yeah. So one, one of the other questions that we had for you guys, and, and uh, we're going to kind of try to go lightning speed on, through these if we can. Um, so if you have a rock garden outing with a group of three and two paddlers are out of their boat, or in the water, how does the non-swimmer, the one guy left in his boat, prioritize which one he goes after? Or they, I should say, they go after. Uh, not enough information. The ones who's in greater danger. The first thing, what's your number one priority? You wanna save 
you know, you want to bring back both people. Okay. Now, if, if you're the one that owned the boats, maybe you're going to go after the boats first. But uh, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, the person I would say was in most danger. It, it's like a, it's a triage. Yeah. You know, who do they take first at the hospital? And if if neither were in particular danger, I think I would go for the more skilled one first, with the idea that they're more likely to stay in their boat and be able to help the the, the next rescue. That's the thoughts that I had. Um, but it is it's a yeah. lot of it, with a lot of these type of questions. It's a it it's an it depends sort of a thing. I may get the person who's closest, just to get someone in their boat. Um, how close is you know questions like how close is calm water? Are they just are they just likely to go right back in, or was it a rogue wave that you know caught people off guard? Um, I've also you know of course we always go for people first, right, and then boats. What if the boat is washing into the rocks and going to be irretrievable in about another thirty seconds, and the person who's swimming is is just fine? Right, and and one of the other things on for a boat first, so we had some place to put the swimmer when we brought the, brought the boat over. Yeah, and with that, how often do people, when they get out of their boat, just sit there, you know, placidly, rather than being an active swimmer? If I get out of my boat, I mean, with my river experience, when I get out of my boat, if I get out, I grab that boat and I'm swimming ashore. <laughs> You know, you just, yeah, just, you know, you just, hey, I'm getting ashore. <laughs> the same thing in a rock garden. One of the things I loved about the Tsunami Rangers, and, you know, uh, Eric's not with us anymore, but, you know, he says, if you're going to paddle there, you better know how to swim there. So these morons would jump off the cliffs with their X-1 rocket boats and play around in the waves and the rocks, all right, in full body armor. And they used to call it TNT, tuning and timing. So before we go out in a surf session, we have everybody body surfing. We end up getting used to the, the rhythm of the water. You know, uh, one of the things is when I'm in my boat, I don't want to get wet. Hey, kayaking's a wet sport. Let's immerse ourselves in the conditions we're going to be playing in. And practice self-recoveries of pulling your boat out. You know, going for your boat rather than sit there and save me, save me. Yeah. So that's one of the things... If two people go out, you know, maybe they should be working to just swim out of the area. Do we even have to get them? Maybe, okay, you guys or gals, you swim out there and we'll go get your boat. That could be another option. Yeah, I've seen people, they go into that, um, people with a perfectly fine self-rescue sit there and take an uh, inordinate amount of time to be rescued because they're waiting to be rescued as opposed to just doing something and if someone comes if you're in the water and someone comes for your stern instead of your bow on a tea rescue whose fault is that <laughs> exactly <laughs> i mean if, if there I, and i see people just totally disengaged as they lift my stern if i see someone lifting the stern of my boat i'm gonna say other end please that's not going to do any good and i see people in the water not really paying attention that they're actually lifting the sterns like it's, yeah. it, you know, it's your as a swimmer, um, think of yourself as doing an assisted self-rescue. Yeah, you're not a victim. You're, you're involved, keep your brain on. Uh, the whitewater raft guys always say, no one loves you more than you. And <laughs> I, I like it. We did some swimming. Next question, speed round. And um, that was the best thing about it, and I think it would apply to rock gardening is you, you, they basically throw you out in the water and make you swim through some rapids. And so if you're looking to do it in a relative, learn these skills in a relatively controlled environment, that might be a good option for you. Um, we're going to do one more question. Yeah, the first, the first one. Um, so we'll, we'll go to one more question and uh, it's a little bit of a silly question, but I think, I think you'll like it. Um, it's not silly. It's like a very unique it's a situation. Unique, unique situation. Good story, I'm sure. Um, but you are on a remote Arctic kayak camping trip with six people. Two days in, one of them doesn't look well and admits he had a bladder infection before leaving, but didn't want to miss out on the trip. What's next? And apparently this is a true story. And I think one of the things with all these situations is what's a really good question to ask is not what to do, but what could you have done to avoid that? 
Yeah. Um, and one thing that pops to mind with that is if you're going on an Arctic expedition, do you have antibiotics with you? And if you have antibiotics, you would give them antibiotics. And if not, you're going to have um, bigger problems. You probably, if you don't have antibiotics, you probably don't have um, cranberry juice. Yeah, I, I doubt if you, I was to say, you bring out the ocean spray, you know. Yeah, now Roger brings up a great point. Many of the scenarios that you look at, uh, and I know a lot of BATS members have read George Gronset's book on um, deep trouble, and he has a more deep trouble. And he and Matt Bros did a great job in reviewing different scenarios. One of the things that they did not do, which they weren't tasked to do, if you go through the book, if you own the book, go through the book and say, what was their common in all of them or most of them? What common theme? And one of the common themes is sticking to an itinerary. That they, because they said, this is what we're going to do, we're going to do it. They shouldn't have gone into the situation in the first place. So many times we can backseat quarterback after a scenario and say, you know, they should never have gotten into that situation if they would have done this, this, and this. But the bottom line on almost any of our sea kayaking scenarios comes down to one factor. What's the greatest cause of death in sea kayaking? <laughs> Exposure. Well, I thought it was stupidity, but go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> that leads to exposure. But that's if we look at where are the deaths. If we dress for immersion, for a length of time of immersion, we get more options. Yeah. We get more options. So at the very least, that should be one of the things taken care of. I'm I'm curious if you did have any if the persons in the the room here if they had uh, if they did have any antibiotics and uh, I, I reviewed my uh, wilderness first responder evacuation protocol and if the they say if they're not getting better with antibiotics after a couple of days it's an evac so I don't know if you turn were able to turn around and go back or what you had to do um, as far as what Wayne was saying about uh, continuing with your itinerary. Um, that can turn into a, kid, a kidney infection, which is much more serious. And so that would be something to um, get them out of there. Uh, he said, yeah, and if you're gonna be on a trip where you don't have immediate evacuation, that's one of the things you have to calculate. If you're on a trip and it says, what, the Arctic? And you said, okay, we're not gonna be able to get help for five days from when we call. Well, then you better have enough medical supplies that are going to take you for a five-day emergency. You know, it's not a trip out to Angel Island. That's that's perfect. Um, so, um, just we just plug the panelists really quick. Um, both of them have new books out. Uh, Rogers is Basic Illustrated Sea Kayaking, and you got a we got a picture of it on the screen, and Wayne. Is Wayne has a new book that's basically exactly what we just talked about, Practicing Good Judgment, Adventure's Guide to Making Critical Decisions. Um, if you would like to do an additional voluntary uh, contribution, you can Venmo me at henry -Sweat. Um Is there anything you guys would like to say to, to close, Roger, conclusion. in conclusion? Uh, just thanks for, uh, for supporting us for coming on out and for uh, continuing to grapple with these ideas that are uh, a lot of it depends and what's the situation um, very fluid dynamic uh, kind of situation you, that you're trying to deal with learn from your mistakes learn from the mistakes of others yeah keep <laughs> um, one thing I want to add about that new book that came out last year on my book I have 25 scenarios in there, and each one of them, I go through that full list of what I told you in the decision-making process. Um, so I think you'll find some value in that if you like playing with this kind of concept. Um, but don't stop talking amongst yourselves. As Roger said, you know, we, we, learn, we learn best from our mistakes.
you know, good judgment, learn from experience, experience from bad judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, and thanks for coming out and uh, thank uh, Bass for all the years of attending my clinics. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, and thanks to uh, Henry and Pauline for Absolutely. contacting us and getting this all together here. No, there wasn't that much work that went into it, but thanks for doing it anyway, you guys. Oh, what do you mean? It took us an hour yesterday just to get the microphone. Just to get the, just to get the um, sound right. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. It, it all happens. Thank you guys yeah. for your time, and thank you, uh, Bass. I just want to if anybody wants to purchase any of my stuff directly, contact me via email, and then I can give you the 20% discount. If you just go to my web store, you'll pay full price, which I appreciate, but I can give, I can give you a deal. Absolutely. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Good seeing you again, man. You too, Roger. Thank you all of us for putting this on. Yeah. And we'll, we'll send a follow-up email with all of this information, and this will be posted on YouTube if you want to follow up, but we'll send up a summary email so everyone can kind of see it. But thank you all, and talk to you guys later.